Hey, this is Wes. In this video, I want to take a look at how to work with displacement in Blender 2.8 when rendering with cycles. So I'll be exporting material from Substance Designer and we'll show you how to set up the displacement map. I'm also using this scene as a rendering test and a real world look at using the Threadripper 3970X CPU. So I'd like to thank AMD for providing me this Threadripper update and sponsoring this content. All right, so here we are in Blender, and this is the material that I'm going to be working with. This is a completely procedural material that I authored in Substance Designer. And so, like I said, in this video, we're just going to, you know, take a look at how all this is set up. So before we get started, why don't we jump over to Substance Designer and just take a look at the material. All right, so here I'm in Substance Designer, and you can see this is my node structure that I have. This is my sand material. And so here at the very end of my uh, node structure, I have all of my outputs. So if we take a look, we have things like base color and our normal and ambient occlusion and our height. And these are going to be the textures that I export here out of Substance Designer. So what I would do in this particular case is I would just jump over here to this export uh, outputs here. And in this dialog, I can actually batch process exports if I have multiple graphs. But from this particular graph, I'm just going to export the outputs that I have enabled here. Uh, then I can just export this. Now, I have the automatic export when outputs change enabled. This is a really cool feature. So what it does is that, uh, say I do an initial export, and then I go back into Designer, and I'm working in my nodes here. As I make any changes, add anything, Designer's constantly kicking out these exports in the background, which is really cool. So it works almost to establish like a live link between any application that can hot reload or auto reload textures. So I've already done an export, so I don't need to do that here. One other thing I want to uh, bring to your attention, uh, particularly in this case since I'm going to be rendering in Blender, is uh, I usually leave things uh, at default when I'm in terms of Substance Designer shader. So uh, by default, we're in uh, using DirectX. So this is uh, the DirectX orientation for my normal that I have here. Uh, so what I do is I just add this normal invert node that we have. So if you hit the space bar and do a search, you'll find it here under normal, and it's uh, normal invert. This node's pretty handy because it lets you just invert any of these channels. And and by default, it inverts the green channel, uh, which is essentially just going to, um, it's a way to just quickly convert uh, normal from DirectX to OpenGL. So we're just by, we're doing that conversion by just simply inverting the green channel, it gets the job done for me. So I just insert this node here. So if I'm working in designer, I'll keep this off. Uh, then this is going to look correct here in my uh, viewport shader, like I said, because I'm just keeping everything at default DirectX. And then when I go to export to um, an application like Blender where I need to be in OpenGL, I can just simply toggle this option here. And then I know I'm going to generate um, the correct normal map. So like I said, we've done that process and I've exported my textures. Let's jump over to Blender and take a look at the setup. Okay, so here I'm in Blender. And uh, one of the things I'm going to showcase here is I have, you can see here, just a plane and a camera. So I don't have any lights. All of the lighting that I'm doing in this particular scene is just lit with uh, an HDR environment. So if we come over to our shading or a node editor and I go to the world view and we take a look, you can see that I have uh, my background node. And here I have an image that's coming in. This is Corsica Beach. This is one of the HDRs that we ship with in Substance Designer. And you can find that in the, if you go to the program files uh, algorithmic folder, inside the there's a, re, a view 3D res, or excuse me resources view 3D and inside there is a maps folder where you can grab a bunch of these um, EXR maps again the ones that ship with designer so I typically will use those and then uh, to quickly build this off I'm just using Node Wrangler so if you're new to Blender uh, so if we come over to preferences I'll kind of show you what that is if I go to add-ons and do a search for Node you can see here I have the Node Wrangler and it ships with Blender and it's something you can just enable it's a really cool utility for working with nodes. And, uh, you know, myself, I'm no Blender expert. I'm, I'm fairly new to Blender. I've been using it for a few months now, uh, finding it to be a really awesome uh, software. And so I uh, just want to also make videos like this just to kind of help other people who are, are new, coming from different software, looking to learn. And so also just kind of sharing out little tidbits and things like that that I have found uh, in my throughout my learning process of Blender as well. And Node Wrangler is one of them. Very, very handy. Uh, just to give you a quick uh, showcase of how it works, say I had like this background node selected, you hit control T and it generates the nodes for me that I need. So you can see it gives me an environment texture, the mapping node and the texture coordinate. So we'll just delete these guys for now. And you can see here on the mapping, I'm able to use the Z rotation value to just uh, basically rotate my environment, which in a sense, in my case, since that's what I'm using to light, it's changing my lighting. So you can see I can move my sun if you look up here in this area, this is where that kind of sun is. I'm just doing a different type of directional uh, light now. 
But uh, I think I'm just going to move the sun over into this direction. Like I said, now you can see where the source light is now coming from this direction here. Okay, so now let's jump over here to the object tab and let's take a look at the shader itself. So what I have is just a simple plane. And if we take a look at this, I'm gonna hit the tab key just to go into uh, my object mode. And you'll notice that I have uh, a few cuts here. Here, let me drop, drop this here into, uh, into this material preview mode. And here you can see that I have just a plane that I manually subdivided. I just used the loop cut tool to add some subdivisions. I just basically have a 20 by 20 uh, loop cut just to create some preliminary geometry that I'm gonna work with. So let's jump back over here to the rendering tab and we'll jump out of that object mode. And so on the plane itself, you can see that here's where I have my material. And this is the material we're working with. It's just the, the standard principled BSDF shader here inside of Blender. Uh, and then I've just imported in my maps. So you can see here that these are the maps that I've imported. These, these are the ones that I directly exported right out of Substance Designer. And so what I did was, uh, you know, typically in this process, I'll just drag in, like, say, a node like this, uh, or excuse me, a texture, creates a node for me. I can, from here, I can just select it, hit Control-T, which again, using the Node Wrangler, and it gives me, uh, you know, my mapping node here that you can see, and my texture coordinate. And so I did that for each one of the maps I'm going to use. And you can see that what I did was I just did that once, and I'm just using the same mapping coordinate to plug into the vector input of all of the uh, texture nodes themselves. Uh, this way, I can use this one single node to set my scale. So you'll notice that in all of the textures themselves, I'm actually going to be setting a scale uh, of four. So this is basically me being able to do a four by four tile with my texture. And again, I have this one nice little single node that I can do that from. All right, so here's all my textures. Uh, one of the things I wanna bring up here is, uh, let's take a look at my base color. So you'll notice here that I have base color and ambient occlusion, and then I'm just using a multiply node here. I'm doing this to add just a little bit more depth and detail to my base color. So I'm taking my base color, you'll notice here that my color space is set to sRGB. Uh, same thing here with my ambient occlusion, I'm just keeping this guy set to sRGB uh, because I'm basically kind of working with color in, in this kind of mindset here. And I'm using the uh, this, this node here set to multiply, and what this node is, if you're looking for it, if you come over here to uh, color, I'm just using the mix RGB node. Uh, setting this to multiply, and I have my ambient occlusion in color one and my base color in color two, and then the result of that operation, that multiply operation, is going into my base color. So next up, we have our roughness, and you can see here's my roughness, and its color space is set to linear because this represents data. So I want to make sure that that's set to linear, make sure that it's interpreted correctly by the shader here in Blender, so we just set that to our roughness. Next up, we have our normal map. Uh, this here, again, is representing data, so color space is set to normal. Here I'm using the normal node, and so we pull that in. In this case, I left the strength to one, and then I plug that into my normal. Uh, again, I want to reiterate that all of these texture input nodes are, again, their vectors being pulled from uh, one single mapping node. And like I said, that's handling all of my uh, tiling here for my texture. Now we're gonna to get to the actual displacement. And so here you can see that I have my height map. Again, the map that I just exported from Substance Designer. It's here, drag and drop that in, and you can see the color space is set to linear. And then here I'm using the displacement node. So if you hit Shift A and just do a search for displacement, whoops, go in here and do a search, you'll see that we have our displacement node. And that's what I have here. So color, it's going into my height. Uh, then I leave my mid-level set at 0 0.5, uh, which is the default, excuse me, default. And then I have my scale set uh, appropriately. Uh, we'll see more on this in just a moment. And then this displacement is actually plugged into the displacement input of the material output. So this is how things are set. Now, at this stage, uh, if you set it up like this, you wouldn't see anything happen, okay? Because we wouldn't have any displacement. So a couple things we need to do. Number one that's really important is you need to come over to the material, which we already have selected. So for example, I have my material selected and I'm taking a look at the material itself. I'm sorry, I have my plane selected and I'm taking a look at the material. And if we scroll down, you can see here that we have, well, we have displacement and that's set. But really what you need to do is you'll see this guy's kind of closed up by default. You'll come down here to settings and you need to make sure that your displacement is set to either displacement only or displacement and bump. So by default, it's set to bump only, and I'll show you what this does. So we'll set this to bump only, a uh, little bit of updating happening here in the viewport, but what you'll see is that uh, it's basically gonna look like this. So uh, once you plug in your uh, displacement map, this is what you would get. 
Uh, so again, it's it's kind of a gotcha. You'll run into this if you're not aware of the setting underneath settings, uh, but you need to make sure that displacement is set to either displacement only or displacement and bump. And I use both displacement and bump. So once we set that up, this is where you can then drop back over to uh, the displacement node, and that's where you're going to set the scale. And so for here, I just used a value of 0 0.04, which gave me the uh, displacement that I was looking for that most closely matched uh, the displacement setting that I was getting inside of Substance Designer. All right, so uh, that takes care of the material setup. Now, there is another thing that we need to do with this plane. So with the plane selected, I then drop over here to uh, my modifier stack, and this is where I add a subdivision modifier. And you can see that I have just the default, Catmull Clark is what's enabled. Now you'll also notice that I have this setting here for adaptive. And this is going to be enabled uh, specifically if you have an experimental setting enabled in your renderer. And so here's what I mean by that. You need to come over to your render settings. Notice here my render engine is using cycles, and my feature set is set to experimental. By default, it's set to supported. And if you have supported, you will not see this adaptive setting here. So again, make sure that your feature set is set to experimental. Now also here, my device, I'm doing my rendering on CPU, because like I said, I'm really using this to throw a lot of polygons here at the, at the Threadripper to see how the 3970X is going to handle this. Uh, okay, so we're going to come back over to our modifier. And like I said, everything by default, I just had adaptive set. Uh, oh, yeah, something else that we can do here as well. Let's go back over to our scene, and you'll notice here that we have the subdivision. Now, the preview setting here by default will be set to 8 pixels. And this is fine if this is, you know, what you want to use here. Uh, but in my case, I, like I said, I, I don't want to hold back. I want to you know, even take my preview up to super high quality. So I'm going to set this to a value of 1. And you can see what it'll do here for my preview. So we'll let this, you can see it's updating the mesh uh, BVH plane. And as soon as that gets done, uh, there we go. We get a nice refinement. Now I'm getting some really nice quality in here. So that's basically the entire shader setup. As you can see, it's quite simple. Uh, the only few things that you have to really look out for is making sure on your material that if you scroll down, make sure that you have your displacement has displacement enabled underneath the settings. Uh, also in your renderer, make sure your feature set is set to experimental. In your modifier, make sure that your subdivision surface, then you have adaptive enabled. And that'll take care of all the subdivision for us based on this dicing scale. Uh, so, and like you said, at default, I'm getting a really nice, fine uh, displacement. This was, this was working really, really well, and I was uh, pleasantly surprised even just at all the default settings. All right, so now we're actually going to do a render, and here's where I can actually take a look at how the Threadripper is handling this. So let's come in here and do render, render image, and let me just uh, minimize this window here a bit, and we'll just zoom this out. Here you can see that it's going to take a little bit of setup. So we have this, uh, it's tessellating the plane now, loading in my maps, computing normals, and, and doing what it needs to do before we actually start getting into the process of uh, actually creating these pixels for us. All right, so now we can see that the, uh, the rendering process is now fully kicking in. If we take a look, we can see that uh, all of the cores, all 32 cores are activated at 100%. And the uh, Threadripper is uh, kicking along here. And this render is uh, moving pretty quickly. So I'm just going to let this go through. And I'm not going to speed or change any of this part of the rendering up. Um, we're just going to see how this performs. And there we go. So here we have our render is complete. Uh, one of the things that I've also noticed uh, that, that's pretty awesome uh, and that's different. So in my 39, this is a 3970X. And the difference between the 1950 uh, that I had previously is uh, the, the level of multitasking I'm able to do. So for example, let's say that, uh, well, here, I'll show you. Uh, let's jump in here and uh, we'll close this render view down. And I'm just going to jump over here and I'm going to redo a render again. So let's Let's just render this image. Uh, again, let me just minimize this render window here. And so here, while this is starting to work, I'm going to jump back over to Substance Designer. 
And so while that's processing, so again, it's you know computing normals, uh, tessellating the geometry. I'm jumping back here in Designer, and you can see I still am able to work uh, here. So one of the things that I kind of wanted to do while that's kicking off is let's jump over here to uh, some of these shapes. So I had uh, some of these kind of uh, small little shapes that I had in my sand. Didn't really like what I had for the first part of it. So one of the things that I did here was I started in uh, by just creating some new shape. So I have this little simple shape. We're gonna blur this here. And then, you know, I have something like clouds too. Do a directional warp. I'm basically creating my own little noise here as I do this. Uh, again, you can see just how responsive Substance Designer is as that full render is taking place. It's pretty cool. Uh, so here I'm gonna run a levels on this. And then I did a transform. So again, I'm just trying to get a shape like this. One of the reasons I'm doing this is because I'm trying to basically create my own grunge map instead of using one of the more heavier to compute grunge maps that we ship with in Designer. Uh, and then I'm just gonna run a blend, which is going to just run a multiply over this. And then lastly, we have a little levels control here. So this gives me this little, you know, kind of piece of debris here. Now you can see that the full rendering is taking place. Again, just you can see that I'm able to work, you know, just flawlessly here in designer, no, no issues. Uh, so we're gonna run this guy into here. Uh, let's grab another variation of that and run that into my uh, tile generator. And let's take a look at the result of this. So we'll come over to here and you can see, uh, yeah, so I'm using these shapes now. And uh, let's take a look at what this does to the actual material itself. Uh, oop, I can see the processing is now done over here. Uh, so here, let's take a look at my 3D view now. So this, this debris here is actually a lot better. I kind of like this. Uh, so let's just say that I want to actually work with this instead. So one of the things I could do, again, um, if I, I haven't done an export, but again, this would be a prime example if I use that uh, automatic export. If I had done the export previously and, and let this go, all of that work be kicking out behind the scenes. Uh, but here, I'm just going to go and redo that export. So you can see that's gonna export there in the background. Again, I'm exporting everything out at this uh, uh, 4096 or 4096, we'll say 4K resolution here. And that export is done. Uh, let me jump back over here to uh, Blender uh, and also my render is done. So now I think I'm just going to jump back over here to the shading tab and uh, you'll notice that the, the textures that I had just exported out of Substance Designer have already reloaded here inside of Blender. Uh, so that's awesome. You can see how quick it is just to make changes, you know, jump over to Designer, make any changes, export, come back into Blender, everything's ready to go. Uh, so now that I have that set up, uh, you know what, might as well do another render. So here you can see I'm going in and I'm just going to render the image once more. And uh, here, let me just uh, move this window so we can see the task view, uh, get a good idea of the process of the CPU. And I'm just going to sit back and just let the thread ripper, well, I'll say rip through this render and produce another image for me. Okay, so here I'm just, uh, you know, I'm just going to let the render take place. Uh, this stage right here takes a bit. This is where, uh, you know, the, the ground plane or the plane that I have is being uh, tessellated, normals being computed, and so on. And so, you know, this process here takes uh, just a bit before we get into uh, the actual rendering. And so, like I said, yeah, I'm just going to let this sit here, uh, try to talk through it if I can. Uh, but, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll get into the rendering part here in just a moment. Okay, so here we go. Uh, we're starting to get some uh, pixels on the screen. Like I said before, you can see uh, all cores are activated. Uh, this is the 3970X with 32 cores. Uh, and, and yeah, it just cranks right through it. Uh, so I hope the, this video has been uh, informative, uh, that you uh, were able to learn a bit. Like I said, I've been really pumped about uh, working in Blender using uh, Cycles. Uh, the, the quality is, is quite astounding. It's easy to use. And uh, yeah, I've been really happy with it. Uh, also, uh, the 3970X, I have to say, has been quite an amazing CPU, uh, a very dramatic upgrade over the 1950X CPU that I had previously, and very happy, uh, like I said, with not the overall speed, performance, temperature-wise running uh, pretty much the same as my 1950X. And like I said, my most pleasant surprise has just been the ability just to really tax the CPU uh, on all cores and yet still be able to switch uh, you know, back and forth through apps and continue to work. So I'm going to close out this video. Thanks a lot for watching, and I'll see you next time.